Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're going to try to do some more low-cost laptops here on the channel, especially as we get into the back-to-school season. And I just got in this one from Lenovo recently. This is their Yoga 7, and this is a 16-inch laptop that at the moment is selling for $799 at Best Buy. And it's not bad for the price point here. We're going to take a closer look at what this laptop is all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now, this is one of Lenovo's yoga devices, which means you can use it like a laptop like I have here. But you can also fold the display back here and use it like a big tablet. And of course, you've got a 16-inch display here to work with. Now, the pen for this is optional. I did not get one with this uh, loaner unit. But if you do have the Lenovo pen, you can write, of course, on the screen and do artwork and all sorts of other things that Windows lets you do with a pen interface. And that might be one accessory you may want to consider purchasing. Additionally, you can have it work in media mode here where the keyboard acts as a display stand or you can put it into tent mode if you want to get more creative with it as well so you've got some flexibility in how you use this the 16 inch display here of course is a touch display it seems to be working pretty nicely here and pretty accurately as i uh, put my fingers on it so all in a nice display but this is not calibrated for professional work, so it's not going to cover the full color space that a professional photographer or video editor might be looking for. So if you are serious about your artwork, this is probably not the laptop to consider given that. It runs at 300 nits of brightness at 1920 by 1200 for its resolution. It is a 16 by 10 aspect ratio display, so you have a little more height than the 16 by 9 1080p laptops do. And all in for a basic display, it actually looks pretty good. Now it is powered by an AMD Ryzen 8640HS processor. And normally those AMD chips are great for graphically intensive tasks like video editing and gaming. Here that chip is going to be hindered slightly by the fact that this only has eight gigabytes of RAM on board and that RAM is not upgradable. So you're not gonna get a lot of the newer AAA titles to boot up on this if you're looking to play some games, but older games will run just fine on here, and this chip has very good graphics performance, but again, hindered uh, by the RAM, which it has to share between the system and the graphics side of things. Uh, this has 512 gigabytes of NVMe storage. That is upgradable if you want to swap out the internal storage later. Weight-wise, it is quite heavy, 4.39 pounds or just under 2 kilograms. The weight is due to a couple of factors. One is its nice thick metal case here, which is metal all throughout. Additionally, the glass is also very thick on the display here. It feels very sturdy. So I like the build quality here, but that does contribute to the weight quite a bit. Another factor is that it's got a big battery on board, 71 watt hours and that'll be good for running this thing, I think north of 10 hours most of the time if you keep the display brightness at a reasonable level and stick to basic things like word processing, email, movie watching, and things that don't stress the processor too much. That's pretty good in a laptop at this price point, and they solved the battery issue just by approaching it with brute force. Put a big battery in here and it will go longer than a smaller battery will. Now, like most Lenovo laptops, it's got a nice keyboard here with large keys that are well-spaced. It is also backlit here, as you can see, so you can see it in the dark. It's got a number pad because the keyboard deck is so large here. The numbers, though, are smaller than the regular keys are, so that might take a little bit of getting used to. But I like the fact that it's got a large zero, enter, and plus key here, so it's a proper calculator pad. The touchpad here feels very nice. It is a physical clicking pad and you can click throughout most of the pad to register your clicks. Very accurate, did not uh, do too many errant uh, detections of things that I did not intend to do and I was happy with it. You also have a fingerprint reader here for getting into the laptop quicker than your password or pin code might get you in. And then on the top here is where your speakers are located. They are stereo speakers. They sound pretty good, they're about two watts each. Not a huge range of sound, but better than what you typically see on a laptop at this price point. 
And of course, you can plug headphones in or use Bluetooth headphones if you want better audio quality. But I did find speech to be very clear out of this, both for spoken word podcasts and web conferencing. The only issue you run into, though, is that when you flip this into its display mode, for example, those speakers are now downward firing into whatever surface they are sitting on. So it sounds a lot better in laptop mode than it does in some of the other modes that you can put the laptop into. Now this does have a good selection of ports on board and we'll take a look at the left hand side here first. So here you have a full size HDMI output along with two full service USB type C ports. By full service, I mean you can put power in you can also get video out and then run your data devices. Both of these are USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, so they can support 10 gigabit devices, but this does not support the newer USB 4 standard, which would be faster. But good to see two full service ports here. Note that you have to power the laptop through one of these two USB-C ports. So unless you have a dock attached, you're going to have to give up one of these ports when it is plugged in. Over here, you've got your headphone microphone connector. And then on the other side, you have your power switch. I don't like the location of this power button. I keep hitting it by accident. The good news is, is that if you hit the power button, it just puts the computer to sleep rather than turning it off completely. But I think you might find yourself hitting it often if you are handling the laptop a lot and switching it into its different modes as you flip the display around. Here you have a micro SD card slot for augmenting its onboard storage if you want and of course using camera cards. And then you've got two USB 3 ports. These are full-size USB-A ports that run at five gigabits per second each. And the top one here will charge your phone even when the laptop is off. Now it has a 1080p webcam at the top that will shoot video at 30 frames per second. It looks good for web conference calls. I think if you were doing some streaming or something, you'd want a higher quality camera, but better than expected. And then up here at the top, you have a shutter to close off the lens physically when you don't want to have it on. So you can hide the lens without having to put some tape up there at the top. All right, let's take a look now and see how it performs. We'll begin with some web browsing here and go up from there. Uh, we are connected via Wi-Fi to a Wi-Fi 6 network in my home. Here is the nasa.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything is super fast and responsive as it should be on a device like this one. So things happen very quickly when you tap on them, as you can see, and I don't anticipate any issues browsing the web. The screen does bounce a little bit when you do touch it, so it might work better as a touch device in tablet mode versus the desktop mode here. And I think it's likely due to the size of the screen and just how heavy the glass is on it. But uh, browsing the web works just fine. And a little bit earlier, I took a look at YouTube running a 1080p 60 frames per second video. I did get a couple of drop frames at the outset, which is normal, but after that, it was able to keep up and play back YouTube without issue. You should not have any problems watching media from any of the major streaming services on here. Everything should look and play great on this device at good performance. And on version three of the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 14.4 which is right in the margin of error with what we see on other competing Ryzen devices that we have looked at lately here. So no performance issues that I can see doing basic tasks. Let's take a look at video editing now. So this is DaVinci Resolve running with a 4K 60 frames per second project. As you can see here, it's actually running better than you might think with only eight gigabytes of RAM. It was able to do that cross dissolve there in real time and a few other transitions that I threw at it also worked fine as well. So I think if you're sticking to basic video editing, this will be fine. But if you're doing a lot of fancy color correction or 3D effects or whatever, that's going to go beyond the scope of what this can handle, especially with only having eight gigabytes of RAM. But the basics do perform quite nicely here. And now it's time for some fun stuff, some games here. This is Fortnite running at the lowest settings at the native resolution of the display, 1920 by 1200. And as you can see here, the frame rate is variable. It goes from like 50 all the way up to 80 and more, and it doesn't stay very consistent. And I think that's due to the lack of RAM and having to swap things in and out to make everything work. So I think if we were to run this at a slightly lower resolution, we'd get a little more consistency to the frame rate. But here at the native resolution, even at lowest settings, it is uh, going to be all over the place. 
One game, though, that did run quite nicely was GTA 5, which is now an older game. Uh, this was also running at 1920 by 1200 at the lowest settings, and the frame rate was much more consistent here, uh, likely due to the hardware that was being targeted at the time of its release. So this was a very nice experience here. Other older games should run well, too. Uh, but some of the newer games that we like to test here on the channel, like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Doom Eternal, did not load due to the lack of RAM. So that 8 gigabytes will hinder you a bit for modern games. But there's a lot that will run on this, especially older games going back from the 2010s all the way through the 70s and 80s. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 2,559. And you will note that is very close to what we saw out of a Ryzen chip from the prior generation on that HP Pavilion above it on the chart there. And that's because this chip is not much different than the prior generation. They did some slight tweaking, but beyond that, it is largely the same architecture. So that is why the score there is the same as last year's model. On the 3 d Mark stress test, we got a failing grade of 94.3%. That means that when this machine is placed under heavy sustained load, like it might be in a game, it's going to lose just over 5% of its max performance as that game is running. But if you're doing things like we did before, video editing, web browsing, things that don't hit the processor for that long of a period of time, all should run at the full performance. It's just things like games and other tasks that stress the processor uh, that will, of course, result in that performance degradation. There is a fan on board. It is not very loud, even under heavy load. And I suspect that might be why it got that failing grade, uh, given the fact that they probably wanted a quieter fan for this consumer-focused laptop. All right, one last thing to take a look at, and that is its Linux performance. A little bit earlier, I booted up the most recent version of Ubuntu. And as you saw there, the touch display worked, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the video, Everything got detected automatically here and sprung to life. The performance was very good on this too. It felt every bit as zippy on Linux as it did on Windows. So if you are looking to run alternative operating systems, I think the experience on this laptop will be very good for that. So altogether, I think this is a pretty solid value for the price point. It is built quite well. It's got a nice big display. The performance is decent for the things that this laptop is designed for. But I would like to see the sub $1,000 laptops start to get more memory on board, or at least the ability to upgrade that memory. 16 gigabytes would really unlock a lot here if it had it. And unfortunately, this one is limited to eight. It's not a big deal for doing word processing and spreadsheets and web browsing, but if you do anything that's slightly more graphically intensive, that, of course, will become more problematic. So hopefully we'll start seeing things with more memory at this price point. But even with that, I think this one's a pretty good value for what it is. A nicely constructed laptop that's comfortable to use and performs quite nicely for most productivity tasks. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching.